Ladies in Decades. Strangely appropriate, really. I began by asking Dr. Lovelock how he could call himself an optimist when he's just predicted that humans will be reduced to a few breeding pairs in the Arctic before the end of the century. Uh, I was talking there of the worst-case scenario. It ne there's no certainty in science. Uh, it may not be that bad. We, it, it, it may be put back. I don't think we can do it, but it may, we may put it back to something a good bit less serious. Uh, so there's every point. And there's every point in surviving. Even to have a few breeding pairs is worth doing. If the Earth, if Gaia, has a self-regulating system, why, in your mind, has it gone so wrong now? Ah, well, that's a fairly easy one. It certainly has a self-regulating system, and it's kept the planet fit for life for, what, three and a half billion years, which is pretty good going. But, like any organism, and I like to think of it as a kind of organism, and not, not just... Uh, um, lump of rock with life on it. Any organism can have periods of ill health as well as periods of health. And it so happens that the interglacials, that's the periods between the ice ages, are a lot less healthy as far as the Earth's concerned than the glaciers are. And it was pr pretty unfortunate of us to start worsening the fever that the planet was already in. And that, that's why we we're in such a mess. And yet if as has happened in the past, we had huge amounts more of carbon dioxide. If 55 million years ago, as you said, carbon dioxide went up fairly major amounts, it's now the highest in 65,000 years. Yeah. But it has happened before. That's right. Why shouldn't it happen again? Well, it will happen again, probably. Do you mean you're talking Why must we flagellate ourselves because it's happening again? Oh, I see what you mean. Well, we weren't around 65 million, uh, 55 million years ago was what the geologists call the hot Eocene event, uh, and that was when as much carbon dioxide went in the air as we're putting in, more or less, and it was followed by 200,000 years of hot snow. But of course, the skeptics say that was nothing to do with burning fossil fuels. No, it wasn't. So why? is the current rise in carbon dioxide necessarily to do with us? Ah, well, it, in some ways that event back then was to do with burning fossil fuels because the most probable explanation of it is that it, what's called a volcanic sill, that's an injection of lava underground that doesn't reach the surface, came up under a major petroleum deposit in the North Sea and that was vaporized up into the atmosphere where it oxidizes, which is effectively burnt, and produced the uh, million, million tons of carbon dioxide. But that was a natural event. It was an accident, a geological accident, but it was burning fossil fuel, mm. if you like. So the Earth accidentally did what we're doing purposely now. There's no way that, that Gaia could regulate its way through this particular no. crisis. We no. have to do it, do we? I don't think we can. We just have to let it happen. But what Gaia does do is get us back uh, on course. But it'll take 200,000 years. But of course every civilization's come and gone. Why should we be any different? Absolutely. I think there have been 30 before us. So are we just clinging to the wreckage? I mean, why couldn't we simply accept the fact that it's time for our own decline and fall? Well, think of yourself and me as like a couple of uh, suburban Romans <laughs> about 300 years, 350 years AD, talking about our civilization. Are well, you suggesting that the Romans didn't have the wherewithal to try to save themselves, but maybe we do? No, no, I'm not. I'm just saying they would have been in denial, I'll bet. They'd have said, oh, the week, it's not going to fall apart, it's just going through a bad patch or something yeah. like that. But the Dark Ages came, and that's quite a probability for and us. If, and if say. they'd been better prepared for them, then <laughs> it might have been easier. I'm not sure. I think we're doomed to make mistakes. It's part of nature. The issue of nuclear power, of course, is, has brought you some stern criticism from the Greens, with whom you've long had a somewhat ambivalent right. relationship. The Greens, of course, 
say that you are a green yes with a few qualifications. You've always criticised them for their with their eschewing of nuclear power. Yeah. Why are you so convinced that it isn't the dangerous source of power that most people, and I'm speaking from New Zealand, New Zealand has certainly put its face against nuclear power. It isn't even on the agenda there. Why are you so convinced you that that... Well, that's arguable. I mean, in New Zealand, I know you think that we're, you know, we've got huge amounts of hydroelectricity, but people don't want their rivers dammed. Okay. Well, so, I mean, it's up to you which you That's do. right. But what convinces you that nuclear power is safe? Oh, uh, experience, really. I've wor worked with nuclear radiation all my life, and I know how to handle it and what it is. I've been to our nuclear waste disposal place, Sellafield, had a look at it, taken a handheld radiation monitor along with me. 80% of the site, the radiation level was no different from here, about 0.25 microsieverts per hour. Uh, I went to see the big store, and it's not that big, it's not a lot bigger than one of these tents. Which all is all of a, the high level waste. A fair, a fair size living room. Yeah, well, yeah. a bit bigger than that, because that's 40 years of high-level waste, both civil and military. And uh, I had my monitor with me, and I went round, and it was barely above the, that of the streets of St Ives in Britain. It was up to one at microsievert per hour, and the EEC level for lifetime exposure is three microsieverts, so it's perfectly safe, actually, where it's at. And I don't see it as any danger whatever, unless you're daft enough to go inside and sit on it. And you don't have to. Who's promulgated the misinformation about nuclear power then, do you think? Well, I think it all occurred during the Cold War. Both sides, America and Russia, were very anxious to discourage the nuclear industries of either power. And I think a great deal of misinformation was put out then. And also, it was right, in a way, to be scared of a nuclear war. I mean, it would have been a dreadful holocaust. And you in New Zealand, rightly, were fearful even of the bomb test in the Pacific. I mean, they let off an incredible amount. I think most people don't know that those bomb tests were equivalent to 200 Chernobyls. Uh, and yet we all breathed it in. You did, we did, the whole, went around the whole world. We live longer than ever, so it's not all that bad. And of course, there are reports coming out from Chernobyl about an increase in thyroid cancer. Oh, there was an increase in thyroid cancer, but there always is if you uh, get a, a radiation event like that. And the children have not been prepared beforehand by being given potassium iodide, which they weren't in Russia. Um, but no, I, didn't, I think there were no thyroid deaths, or perhaps at the most one. They were all treated. You see, it seems to be back on the agenda in Britain, nuclear power. Do you think that what you would like to see will happen, which is the recommissioning of the ageing nuclear power plants and presumably more being built? That's right. No, not, not, I don't, I'm not asking for more to be built. I think all we need is to make sure that the ones we've got are just, where, as they wear out, to put new reactors put in. What's the point of wasting a pile of money building a new one somewhere when you've got a perfectly good site, it's got the electricity uh, pylons all joined up to it, the planning permission and all those slow, miserable things has all been done. They're so all on the easy. coast. It doesn't matter. Well, what I about the rising sea levels? It, it, no, don't forget, what I'm talking about is I'm thinking the next 30 years or so perhaps a little more than that. The sea level, by no estimate, will have been risen enough in the next 30 years to be any hazard to those particular plants. I'm, I'm interested in whether your hypothesis of Gaia has, has altered substantially over the years. Well, it was originally a hypothesis, and the hypothesis was that life somehow regulates the atmosphere so as to keep the Earth always fit for life. Um, it's both its climate and its composition. That was challenged by the biologists who quite rightly said there's no way that organisms could regulate anything beyond themselves. Uh, I, I knew that the planet was regulated because our atmosphere is so extraordinary. 
and it requires regulation and something is doing it and it was a little took me two years before it dawned on me but it wasn't life that regulates the planet but the whole system life, the rocks, the air, the oceans, all working as one. All interacting. That's right. right. And the whole system. And then I made models of that. The famous one, Daisy World, was the first. Where um, you had the why. dark daisies yeah, reflect. I like to call it a theory now, because it's, um, uh, it's based on mathematical models. It's made predictions that have been proven uh, in practice. Ten predictions, actually. And uh, one of our scientific societies, the Geological Society, recognised it publicly only a couple of months ago. Although at times you say that it's a metaphor as well. 